Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, today we will continue talking about um, oscillations where friction is involved. So this is the second um, lecture about friction, uh, damping, like slowing down basically, um, the oscillations. The first one, which was called um, friction damping number one, it was that was the view from the energy um, uh, consumption. Basically, as um, the object oscillates, it loses its energy on friction because friction is a force and you have to overcome that force. That means work being done and that's why the total, um, let's say, potential energy which the object has when you s uh, stretch the spring uh, is basically lost as the time goes on. And uh, we have come to certain um, quantitative characteristics of such a motion. Um, now, we will continue talking about the friction affecting the oscillations, but now we will try to just do it from um, the uh, movement as the function of time, basically. So you will be able to find out exact position, not just the ending points, um, which we did uh, from the energy consideration, but actually exact position and, and speed, if you wish, of the object as it oscillates on a spring with a friction. Okay, <coughs> now this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on unizor.com. Um, this is um, the course which is based on the prerequisite one. Uh, prerequisite course is called Math for Teens. Math is absolutely necessary because, for instance, today we will talk about trigonometry and calculus, uh, differential equations. Um, so, um, I do suggest you to watch this lecture and any other lecture from the Unisor.com. Um, you might have found it somewhere else, like on, on, on YouTube, for instance. Uh, but over there, it's just individual lectures. Unisor.com presents a course, basically, which means lectures are organized in a logical sequence. They are dependent. Every subsequent lecture depends on whatever was before. So it's a course. So I do suggest it. Plus, every lecture has textual uh, notes, which basically can be considered like a textbook. Um, if published separately, if you wish. Um, also, it has exams in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases exams, so you can self-check yourself. Um, now, the site is totally free, you don't even have to sign in if you don't want to. Um, no strings attached, uh, no ads. Okay, so let me start. So, we have a spring. with object at the end. This is object. Now, there is a friction here. Now, M is mass, G is free fall acceleration, MG is weight, basically, and uh, the force of the friction is equal to mu times M times G, where mu is a coefficient of uh, friction. Well, in this case we're talking about motion, so it's a kinetic uh, friction. You know, there is a static friction and kinetic friction. Let's just forget about this small thing. Friction has this mu <coughs> um, coefficient of friction, and if you multiply it by weight, that actually gives you the force. Force of friction, which acts always against the motion. So if motion is to the left, the force is directed to the right. If motion is to the right, the force of friction is directed to the left. Okay. Regardless of whether the spring is, let's say, it's stretched or it's squeezed, doesn't really matter. Now, the force of the spring, in turn, depends on the position. K is the elasticity of the spring, 
and x of t is position. So we are assuming that there is a zero which is a neutral position of the spring. It's not squeezed, it's not stretched. So whatever goes to the right of this, this is a stretch and this is a squeeze. So to the right x is positive and the force is negative directed towards the negative to, towards the neutral position. If the x is negative, which means the spring is squeezed, the force is uh, again uh, opposite to this negativity, which means uh, to the positive direction, that's why it's positive. So if x is negative, force is positive. If x is positive, force is negative. Now, the previous lecture was about energy, and we have found that if you have initial position at times t0 that equals to 0, we have position at point A, so this is stretch by A, and then let it go, well, it will go to the left in this particular case, it will squeeze, after passing the neutral point, it will squeeze the, uh, uh, the spring and uh, it will lose a minus 2 lambda with a minus sign because we are on the left from the neutral. We are losing certain um, amplitude. So if this was plus a, this is not minus a but slightly less on the minus sign by absolute value than a, where lambda is um, a constant which was mu, uh, what else, m g divided by k, if I'm not mistaken. All right? Where is my lambda here? Right. Okay, so that was uh, the previous lecture we came out. Now I would like to find actually the equation of motion. I would like to find function x of t. Now there is a difficulty here. Now the difficulty is that during um, let's say a cycle. Cycle is from the uh, rightmost position to the left and then back to the rightmost position. Well this is a cycle and during that cycle the force is changing the sign. When the uh, object moves to the left, the force is positive. When the uh, object moves to the right, the second half of the first cycle, the, uh, the friction force is directed to the left. So I can't really put it into one formula like this. This is absolute value, basically. If, to be exact, this is absolute value of the, uh, the force. Now here I have exact formula because if x is positive, which means it's stretch, um, spring is uh, force of the spring is negative, it's directed towards neutral position. If it's negative, it's positive. But in this case, it, I can't really do it. So what I'm going to do, I will divide basically my first cycle into two halves. One half from this point, from the stretched point towards this, and that would be one differential equation. And then from here back to this, it would be another differential equation. So that's the idea. Okay. So, <coughs> I would like also to assume that A is significantly greater than lambda. Because if A is smaller, uh, if it's relatively of the same order as lambda, my oscillation will just finish in no time, right? Because every time we are subtracting two lambda from, from the amplitude. So let's assume that A is large enough to basically stay um, on the positive side if we are subtracting uh, two lambda on one uh, uh, cycle, uh, half a cycle, two lambda on another, half a cycle, etc. All right, so um, now, if you remember, if there is no friction, we had a very simple differential equation where we were comparing the Newton uh, uh, force, which is um, mass times acceleration. Acceleration is second derivative of 
um, law of motion, we were actually equating it with the Hooke's law. This is the Hooke's law minus kx of t. Now, this is a differential equation. Now, there are certain initial conditions, and we have assumed that initial condition is stretch by a and no initial speed. That's our initial conditions. And we have basically resolved this to a very uh, simple solution. a cosine omega t, where omega is square root of k over m. That was one of the first lectures dedicated to oscillations. Now, with damping, with the friction force, we have a slightly different equation. So, what is our equation in this particular case? Now, it's not only the force of the spring which acts on the object. So, initially we stretched it, so the initial motion would be to the left, right? Which means our force is direct, uh, force of friction directed to the right against the motion. Okay. <coughs> so this force is towards um, neutral point. That's why it's negative. Uh, as it passes the neutral point, x changes the sign to negative, and the force becomes positive this way. But the friction is always this way, always against the motion. So this is my friction, mu mg, right? Coefficient of friction times the weight. And this is my um, differential equation, which describes the motion. Now all I have to do is just to solve it with these initial conditions. Now, for convenience, instead of zero, I will put here t0 times zero, where time zero is equal to zero. Why do I do it? Because I will have t1 when object is reaching the end of this squeezing um, uh, motion. That would be T1, and then back would be T2, etc. So that's how it's more convenient to have it as an index T0. Alright, so we have this condition, we have this condition, and we have this differential equation. Now, I assume, now this is a constant, by the way, mu is a constant, right? M is mass, and G is um, uh, free, fall, free fall acceleration. It does not depend on the motion of the object. This is a constant, which means my solution to this differential equation should be almost the same if, if, if there is no such a constant. So I'm guessing, an, I have an intelligent guess, let's put it this way. My solution might actually look like this. Where a and b sum coefficients. Now, if you remember, Again, I was just writing this for non-friction when there is no this term. It was just a cosine omega t. That was solution for x t. So in our case, I have something similar, and that's why I hope that it will be a solution. Well, it's a it's a good guess actually. So let's just try to find out if it's possible, which means I will take the first derivative, the second derivative, substitute to this, and see if it fits, right? Okay. Um, okay, I can use this. So my first derivative is equal to um, cosine derivative is minus sine and then there is an inner inner function omega times t so omega goes out so I have a minus a omega sine of omega t now this is a constant so uh, it does not appear in the first derivative 
Now the second, the second derivative is from sine, the derivative is cosine, and again inner function is omega, so I will have minus omega square. Uh, cosine omega t. Okay, now let me change slightly this particular equation. I will um, divide it by mass m here, m here, and m here. Now you remember that um, omega omega is equal to square root of k over m. That's how it was in the very very first lecture and from there on that's basically the angular frequency. So omega square is k over m. So this equation can be viewed as I'll put it to the left. So it's plus k over m is omega square x of t uh, minus mu g equals to zero. Okay? So that's my uh, the same differential equation, just different um, different letters here. Okay, so instead of second derivative I can substitute this and instead of function I will have this so let's see what I will have minus a omega square cosine omega t that's this one right now omega square times x of t this is x of t so it's plus a omega square cosine omega t plus omega square b plus omega square b minus mu g equals to zero and you see minus and plus and so what do I have? I have basically expression for b b is equal to uh, mu g divided by omega square uh, which is mu g divided by k times m and our familiar lambda. Lambda is, if you remember, was introduced in the very first lecture as a critical distance. Critical distance is very important whenever you have a friction because if you are stretching not sufficiently far from the neutral position, then the force of the spring will not overcome the force of the friction and the uh, object will not oscillate at all. So you need to stretch it greater than lambda to start oscillations. So that's what lambda was. And we're still having exactly the same thing. So it's a very useful constant. It combines in itself the friction itself, which is characterized by mu, it combines the weight of the object and the strength of the spring, elasticity of the spring. So the stronger the spring, uh, the smaller will be this dead distance when the object cannot, um, uh, uh, cannot oscillate. The weaker spring, well, obviously, the dead interval will be greater. The more heavy, the heavier uh, we have the more friction basically we have again the more friction we have the that interval will be wider so this is a very nice uh, kind of uh, uh, characteristic of this particular system so we have B now what is A well we can very easily find A um, if we if we start talking about initial conditions now First of all, um, let's just use this one. At t is equal to zero, we should have a. Now, if t is equal to zero, cosine is equal to one of zero, right? Cosine of zero is one. So we have a plus b. So a plus b 
This E is initial position A. We know B, B is lambda. So A is A minus lambda from here, right? So we have our uh, equation of motion. So our equation is x of t is equal to a, which is a minus lambda cosine omega t plus b, which is lambda. Now, what's important is this is our equation during the first half of the first cycle. Okay found it. Now, how does it look? Well, it's a sinusoidal type, but its amplitude is less than A. It starts with A, but then it goes all the way down to um, uh, to the end point, and we will calculate what exactly this end point is. Um, so it's basically a smaller amplitude. So how can we find out what is the opposite point when you're squeezing the spring all the way to the left? Well, you're squeezing all the, left to the, all, all the way to the left, and it stops at that point, right? Um, it's squeezing the spring uh, and the friction as well, and it stops. Now, when does it stop? when it stops when its speed is equal to zero, right? Now, speed is the first derivative. So when is this equal to zero? Well, when sine is equal to zero, right? So sine is equal to zero when the angle is equal to what? Pi times n, where n is any integer number. Recall your trigonometry which means t is equal to pi over omega times n, where n is any integer number. If n is equal to zero, that's time t zero. And we have the initial, when the spring is stretched initially, we have speed is equal to zero. Then what is the next um, value of t when the spring is also uh, when the object is not is not moving, well, that's when this thing with n is equal to one, right? So we have uh, omega t is equal to pi, right? N is equal to one, so t is equal to pi over omega. Omega t is equal to pi. Cosine of pi is equal to minus one. And what do we do here now? Well. If we will substitute this t to this uh, equation of motion, we will have cosine of pi minus 1. So it would be x of t1. That's the t1 is a point where n is equal to 1. All right? So t1 is equal to pi over omega. t1 is equal to pi over omega. And position is equal to, this is minus 1, so it's minus a minus lambda minus a minus lambda plus lambda which is equal to minus a minus 2 lambda am I right? yes plus minus a plus lambda and plus lambda 2 lambda, yes this is exactly the same result which we have obtained from uh, the energy consideration. During the previous lecture, we were talking about how energy is spent during the friction. Um, and we have found that the um, leftmost position, when the spring is um, squeezed, is uh, at this particular point. Now, I prefer to do it this way rather than 2 lambda minus a because it actually shows that it's on a negative position. We assume that A is large enough to accumulate, to, to, to accommodate subtracting lambda a few times, right? 
So that's a negative position, which means the spring is squeezed. And uh, initial uh, was A on a stretch side, on a, um, on a squeeze side, it's uh, negative, but by absolute value is less than a by two lambda. So, half a cycle eats up two lambda from, the <coughs> from excuse me, from the amplitude, <coughs> and that's again exactly as we have found uh, in previous lecture from the energy consideration. Okay, that's it. That's the end of the first half a cycle. Now let's start the second half cycle. Now we have a different direction of the motion, which means our friction is directed differently. Friction is directed negatively because the object on the second uh, half of the first cycle would move from left to right on our picture. So what is the um, equation of motion? Well, it's exactly the same thing here, except here now we have force is negative because it goes against the motion, which means to the left, which means against the uh, positive direction of x. Now, uh, this simplified equation would look like this. My initial conditions would be different. Now we are talking about T1. And this would and this would be minus a minus two lambda, right? Because that's the end point as it reached the leftmost part, and the speed is still uh, zero at the very uh, at the leftmost point. We are looking for the same kind of a solution here. <coughs> So, um, what would be my solution in this particular case? So, um, uh, uh, x and x uh, and the derivative and the second derivative uh, are, are the same. But in this case, we will have um, this plus plus energy. Right? That's the difference. From which we found that um, okay now if we will put uh, omega now omega what is omega square omega square plus mg minus so it would be minus here right minus here minus here and minus lambda. Okay, minus lambda. Now, if we will substitute into this formula T1, and T1 is what? Pi over omega, so we will have cosine would be minus. So it would be minus A plus B is equal to my initial position is minus a minus 2 lambda. Right? Now B is lambda. So what's the A? Let's start again. Minus A plus lambda equals um, 2 lambda minus A. So uh, A goes here. So we will have lambda minus 2 lambda plus a is equal to a uh, wait 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 now b is minus lambda I'm sorry b is minus lambda so it's minus lambda so this is minus lambda minus lambda so a is equal to a minus 3 lambda. Okay. So my uh, equation of motion would be on the second half would be different, would be a minus 
3 lambda and this would be minus lambda. Now the T is changing from T1 to T2. Now T1 is equal to this, T2 is equal to whenever we put 2 instead of n, so it's 2 pi over omega. So during the times from T0 to T2, from pi over omega to 2 pi over omega, this is the equation. So equation is different. That's what's very important. Equation on the left is one, equation on the right, right is another. So the graph, if you will put the graph, you will just divide it. This is 0, which is uh, t0, then this is t1, this is t2, this is t3, etc. This is initial position, this is leftmost, this is rightmost, this is leftmost, this is rightmost. But what's important is the difference between these is always pi over omega. So it's a constant difference, but the amplitude would be smaller. It's, it's reducing amplitude by 2 lambda every time. So, we have found the second equation, okay. And uh, what's, the, uh, what's the most, um, what's the rightmost point? That's where t is equal to 2 pi over 2, uh, 2 pi over omega, right? the T2. Now, if it's 2 pi over omega, then cosine is equal to cosine omega times T would be cosine of 2 pi, which is the same as 0, which is 1. So I will have A minus 3 lambda minus lambda. So my most rightmost point would be A minus 4 lambda. And that's exactly, again, the same as the same result as we have from the energy consideration. We are losing 2 lambda in amplitude on every half cycle. We have lost 2 lambda on the uh, way back, to, uh, way, way to the left, and we are lo losing lambda, another 2 lambda on, on, on the way right. So squeezing minus 2 lambda, stretching minus another 2 lambda. So now it's minus 4 lambda. And as you understand, it will continue doing exactly the same thing. So every time, amplitude is, is diminishing by 2 lambda. So I assumed in the very beginning that A is big enough, so we have a few cycles, basically, until it's finished. But every time you're subtracting 2 lambda, and eventually you will uh, get situation when A minus whatever number of lambdas it will be within the dead zone and the object will stop oscillating. So it's very important to understand that if there is a friction, constant friction obviously, we are talking about a finite time before it completely stops. Um, in the next uh, lecture when I will talk about uh, instead of friction we will talk about viscosity, like for instance the whole oscillation is underwater, let's say, and, and the water prevents it. There, the slightly different laws of physics are, are actually acting, and we will talk about this. And over there, oscillations, <coughs> excuse me, oscillations will not stop. They will infinitely continue, but will be smaller and smaller and smaller. Here, it's just dead stop with the friction. Okay? So, what's the... Um, the summary of the whole thing. First of all, uh, I probably um, I probably shouldn't really call it period because the period means it's repeating exact motion. So it's not really a period, but it's a cycle. So the cycles between rightmost and then the next rightmost position, which is shorter and shorter and shorter. So the cycles had exactly the same timing from the time perspective. So, after each uh, pi over omega, you have another uh, maximum deviation from the neutral. At zero, at pi over omega, at two pi over omega, at three pi over omega, four pi over omega, etc. That's how it goes. So, the timing of 
uh, left most and rightmost position are the same uh, are, are in the same interval but amplitude will be shorter and shorter and shorter so the graph would look like this and as as I was just talking about the equation of this part is not exactly the same as equation of this part here we have the first one which which was a minus lambda uh, cosine plus lambda and here we have a minus 3 lambda and minus lambda so it's a different equation but they are glued together here and uh, so the x of this is t1 so the x of t1 in the first and the second are exactly the same um, and so is for t2 so is for t3 etc etc and even the first derivative would be the same if you can check it if you wish to um, because the first derivative is zero will be always at these points so we have these two um, these two uh, pieces of this graph glued together relatively smoothly because they are at the same value and at the same first derivative which means that uh, tangential line is horizontal that's the first derivative and that basically completes um, all the research of how um, the friction constant friction affects the uh, oscillations of uh, um, ideal object and ideal spring okay uh, I suggest you to read the notes for this lecture they are relatively well organized like like a textbook basically as I said um, other than that that's it you got it thank you very much and good luck <laughs>